few seconds and then we should be on. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jens, for the intro. And um, actually, I'm not, I haven't really been a clean tech investor for 30 years. I've been an angel investor for 30 years. Um, what I'd like to do while, oh, gee, that was quick. I thought that would take a minute and I could uh, tell a few jokes while we're waiting. <laughs> but uh, so we want to start up here. Is that good? And then we go here. Great, everything's great, I think. Um, so I'm really enjoying this conference and I, I've enjoyed all the presentations so far. I've been an entrepreneur really my entire life. You know, I was selling my mother's uh, raspberries when I was just a kid and I've always been making things and selling them. Um, I got lucky and I started a company uh, which was actually University of Waterloo business uh, in the 70s with classmates of mine in engineering school and we built this company up into a very sizable business. We were making video display terminals which were the precursors to um, desktop computing. And I got lucky and um, I was able to sell the business and make a little bit of money. And ever since then, I've been doing so-called angel investing. Because one of the things that I'm sure you know as an entrepreneur, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, it's a 724-365 proposition. And if you're serious about your business, you have to be totally, totally committed. That's the number one thing I look for when I make an investment in a startup is how committed are you to that company? Now, one of the problems with that is that it's difficult to get a life other than your business. So after being at it for seven or eight years, I spotted an opportunity to sell my company. This was just when IBM introduced the desktop computer in 1981. And I knew at that time that my days were numbered because I had an older technology and sooner or later I would be clobbered in the marketplace. So I again got lucky and I was able to merge with actually six other Canadian companies and we went public on the Toronto Stock Exchange and together we formed a very sizable enterprise. But one of the things that happened during that eight years of building the business was uh, my wife said to me after selling the business, she says, now that you've sold your company, would you like to meet your children? <laughs> and I said, well, that's a good idea. I didn't even know I had some. Uh, so, um, you know, this is what happens when you're an entrepreneur. So I decided at that point that rather than, you know, there was always this urge to do the next thing. And I thought, you know, maybe what I would do is work with university students and startups and help them start companies. And then I can be a vicarious entrepreneur. I can experience being an entrepreneur several times over, not just through myself, but through many other individuals and watch them grow and develop. And then I can come in occasionally and say, well, how are the sales today? How's business going? And I can hold them accountable, much as my investors and my directors held me accountable when I was building my company. So that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And um, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is angel investing because I enjoyed that last presentation on uh, female entrepreneurs and angel networks. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that uh, and maybe give you some ideas because I think it's really important for those of you who are looking for funding to really understand how to engage with angel investors. So first of all, just a quick thing on what I'm doing now. I've actually got three angel networks that I operate um, in Canada and one of them is actually a global angel network. I have three small, and they are quite small, angel funds, and I also have three accelerators that we operate in the Vancouver area. Uh, so certainly no stranger to the startup ecosystem. And presently, my main focus is on clean tech startups. And I'm running a virtual incubator where we bring in not just the capital, but the people, because it really starts with the people not with the capital. And one of the reasons I'm here and why I'm interested in talking to many of you is I'm always looking for joint venturing opportunities and clean tech lends itself very well to that. Now I want to give you a quick primer on angel investing 101 
And for those of you who have seen this or heard of this before, please indulge me for a few minutes because this is really very, very important. I maintain that the only or the primary source of funding for you when you start your company is with angel investors. You might get lucky when you talk to institutional investors or venture capitalists. And of course, you probably already talked to family, friends, and relatives and have a little bit of capital from them, hopefully. But the main first step in approaching arm's length independent investors is angel investors. So want to talk a little bit about what an angel investor is. There were some comments about that by the panel earlier this morning. Uh, someone mentioned, well, you know, people who have wealth from maybe real estate or banking are getting into angel investing. I maintain that a real angel investor is a been there, done that entrepreneur, someone who's done that 724, 365 work, who, who has empathy for the entrepreneur, and knows how to work with and relate to the entrepreneur. So that's how I started being an angel investor. But what's really important to remember is that to sustain this activity and for angel capital to be a resource for entrepreneurs, we as angel investors, you as entrepreneurs, we all have to make money. Otherwise, we can go home and forget about it. So what compels us and motivates us as angel investors is this very seminal study that was done in the U.S. by Rob Wiltbank from Willamette University in Oregon. And he found, and the important number here is forget all this busy graphs and that the number at the very top is the most important number for you to remember, and that's 27%. He found that after studying thousands of angel-backed companies and angel deals, the return to investors is 27%. So that's what we look for. That's kind of the benchmark. Uh, he found that the multiple was actually 2.6 times your money back in three and a half time in three and a half years. But that's an average. Um, the reality is that many paybacks don't occur in just three and a half years. It takes 10 years to build a successful company. Sure, you might get lucky with a dot-com venture and exit in three or four years, but normally it takes a good 10 years to really build a successful enterprise. But what it works out to is 27%, and coincidentally, that works out to 10 times your money in 10 years. You often hear that when you hear angel presentations or pitches. Angels are looking for 10 times their money, and ideally, they'd like to get 10 times their capital back in 10 years. Well, if you do the IRR calculation on that 10 times in 10 years, that's 27% compounded per year. Um, of course, it would be much better to get five times your money in five years. That works out to 38%. Um, but that's the magic number. Now, as angel investors, we know that it's a very, very risky business to invest in startups. In fact, and I hate to tell you this, but most of you will probably fail. Not personally, but with your company. Your company may fail, and the odds are stacked against you. That's a reality. 90% of startups will fail. I know that when I invest in 10 companies, I'm hoping that maybe one, maybe two, will hit it big. My present portfolio is over 100 companies, and out of the 100 companies that I've invested in, a third of them have already failed. A third of them are kind of struggling and doing so-so, and about a third of them might still make it and give me that 10x payback. One of the things that Wilt Bank found in his study was that, and this is frightening, 40% of all of the angel investors in his survey lost 100% of their capital. So that's very frightening. And that's one of the reasons why one of the trends in angel investing today is to do a lot of deals. If you do even 10 deals, it's very risky and very dangerous as an angel investor. The magic number is 16. If you do more than 16, then you have a 10% chance at getting the one out of 10. But if you, do, if you do just 10, you may not even get the one out of 10. So if I'm shooting for a 10X, right, and I do 10 deals, what happens? I get even money. After 10 years, I'm back where I started, and I haven't even made 
a 2 or 3% return on my capital. So I've got to have a lot of winners or I've got to have a big portfolio. So another trend in angel investing, in addition to building large portfolios, is angel funds. And this is a new phenomena and something that I think will help you all as you grow your companies, is to tap into angel funds and angel pools. Because that's one way to get these kinds of returns that Wilt Bank is talking about. Just before I leave this slide, I'll just point out that that blue bar on the right shows that most of the investments, in fact over 50%, fail in within two years and return zero. Um, a, you'll get a one to five times return um, with 30% of the deals and you can see here this little bit down here is what motivates us all and keeps us going but that shows that you can get about a 30 times return but it only happens in three to five percent of the companies that you invest in as an angel investor. So pooling and co-investing is very important. I just listened next door to a number of presentations and I know that a lot of the people that I'm talking to are saying, well, would you invest in my deal? The best advice I can give you is, first of all, get an angel investor close to home. Someone from Vancouver or Silicon Valley is not going to invest in a startup in Santiago unless there is a local angel investor already involved. It just doesn't make sense. And angel investing is very much a contact sport. So it comes down to people on the ground working closely with you. Uh, this will come back, Jens. I think we're okay. So a pool, when I talk about a capital pool, it's basically where a bunch of investors, typically angel investors, will put their money together into a pot, into an account, and then they'll invest that together. Uh, typically a pool has many investors, uh, and they don't all need to be angel investors. For example, I created a pool that involved a lot of university professors, professional people like doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, people who were not angel investors in the sense that they were making millions of dollars or made millions of dollars in their own businesses, but they liked the idea of investing in startups. And so by pooling their capital, they had an opportunity to basically be angel investors. So, a pool has many investors and typically co-invests with knowledgeable investors. So I have three pools that I'm running and I will only invest in a startup if there are direct angel investors in that startup. So some of these funds that I'm running now, for example, could invest in a Chilean company. But it, we would only invest if there were a Chilean angel investor in there working closely with the company because that's so important, that mentorship, that stewardship, and the governance of that enterprise. And I think by having these pools and doing a lot of deals, we can get close to that Wilt Bank 27% return. So I want to shift just really quickly as to why I'm now focusing on, on clean tech, and, and that's not my only interest. I still have a wide portfolio of um, life sciences, as well as IT, uh, medical devices, and, and other technologies. But clean tech is presently quite fashionable, and it's an area that's been a bit neglected by investors. So that means opportunity. And that's why it's of interest to me. I would encourage you to take a look at this um, book uh, written by Canadian author uh, Naomi Klein, and she talks about capitalism versus the climate. Uh, one of our key environmentalists in Canada, David Suzuki, is really promoting this heavily. I had dinner with him just uh, last week and we were talking about some of the opportunities in the clean tech sector. Um, and why, why get involved? Well, we all live in an environment which is changing. Uh, we are faced with climate change. Sure, there are climate change deniers, but I believe it's a reality and it's something that's really going to be front of mind going forward and it's important for us to embrace some of the challenges and problems uh, in the environment. However, if we do it right, we can have profitable businesses, we can act in a socially responsible manner um, and really it comes down to investing in our future. When you invest in clean tech, you're really investing in tomorrow. 
some of the challenges though, and this is where clean tech is a little bit different from traditional angel investing in technology startups, is that it takes much longer to hit a home run. You know, I mentioned to you the 10x in 10 years. In clean tech, it's very close to that 10 year limit, maybe even beyond the 10 year time frame. There's no overnight successes in clean tech. It's more capital intensive. You typically need a lot more money to start a clean tech enterprise because there's equipment involved, machinery, that kind of thing. The sales cycles are much longer. It takes a long time to convince municipalities and governments to buy your clean tech solutions. Um, there are also many barriers to entry because it takes a lot more capital and it's geographically based. But that could be a good thing because it means you, could, you have an opportunity to keep competition out while you build your company. I want to talk about really briefly some of the different areas that you can invest in in clean tech. You can either invest in alternative energy resources or in technologies that are involved with alternative energy. And I'm not going to talk very much about this because I'm sure you're all quite familiar with them. You've got solar, wind, geothermal, ocean, wave, tides, that kind of thing, biofuels, seawater, which is kind of an interesting one. I'll take a minute to talk about that one because I have an investment in it. Um, lithium for battery technologies and, and other compositions. Germany, for example, is a country which is already 25% of its energy is based on renewables, largely from solar and wind. My favorite one on this list, um, and it's, it's an interesting little story, there's an entrepreneur in Vancouver who wants to change the world with fusion technology. So he came to our angel group um, 10 years ago and he's still developing the very first product. So that's 10 years ago. He came to our angel network and this guy, it was Christmas time, so we were all feeling in a good mood and ready to invest and, and be nice. But he was so passionate and excited about how he's gonna change the world with fusion energy. So he's talking about taking um, atoms, smashing them together, generating neutrons, which would in turn provide heat, which would in turn drive turbines, which would create electricity in a safe, environmentally friendly, and very inexpensive manner. So he convinced our group of about 50 angel investors to give him $400,000 to build a little prototype. And um, he got that money in two weeks. And he had no business plan, and uh, he could not tell us when we would get our money back, but we all invested small amounts just because he was so engaging. Um, long story short, he made the prototype with $400,000, and up to this date, he's raised $50 million, about $30 million from venture capitalists, including um, a well-known, um, what I would call super angel investor, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, put in $5 million. Uh, we had Bill Gates there to take a look at it, and although Bill didn't invest, we had a number of other people from Microsoft that put at least a few hundred thousand dollars in very early in the development of this company. So he may still be three or four years away before he can demonstrate something, but it's one example of a clean tech investment that if this pays off, this is not going to be a 10x in 10 years. This is going to be an infinite X in 15 or 20 years. The payoff for this kind of risk is just phenomenal because it is a, a game changer. Um, there are many other alternative energy technologies and uh, you know everything from software, analytics, we've got LEDs, storage technology, storage systems. Water is very popular. There are global issues around water, so that means big opportunities. And of course, waste. We create so much waste, and what are we going to do with it? So again, many, many opportunities in technologies relating to alternative energy and the environment. One of the funds that I've developed to focus on green tech investments is called Green Angel Energy Corporation. And this is also a startup. So not only do I invest in startups, but I like to create new initiatives which themselves are startups. So Green Angel is actually a crowdfunded angel fund. And believe it or not, every one of you in this room could 
today run out and invest in this company, anywhere from a few dollars to a few thousand dollars. Because what we did is we took the ultimate step in crowdfunding and we went public and listed on a stock exchange, on a Canadian stock exchange. So anyone that has access to an online trading account can actually be an angel investor and invest in this fund, which will hopefully produce those 27% type returns that I alluded to earlier. So we have a small initial portfolio. Uh, we, and I've listed a couple of the companies here. I'll mention the first one, Dpoint, real quickly because this is a technology entrepreneur who took a fuel cell membrane technology and repurposed it for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems to basically trap heat that's lost when you're cooling or heating. And he's able to get a 75% energy consumption reduction in commercial buildings. Um, and that's one of the first investments that we made. We also are offering something really interesting, and that's green bonds, which is a new way of investing in startups. So if you have a business which can cash flow, rather than selling shares in your company, you could get project financing. And we've done a couple of these deals where we may put a few hundred thousand or even up to a million dollars to buy the equipment that you need to install at customers' premises. And then as the cash flow comes back from that equipment, you basically pay interest on the loan and eventually retire that loan. So we're selling bonds to investors. We're calling them green bonds. And we will pay investors 9%. We, in turn, generate between 15 and 20% if we do our job right. And that's our incentive for selling these bonds to investors at large. So this is a fund that's open to the general public. But most angel funds are private funds. And here's an example of one. We call this powerhouse technology ventures because what we're trying to do is build a powerhouse in the, in the green technology sector. I don't want to tell you too much about this except for those of you who are involved with governments and with startup initiatives. I'm mentioning this because what's happened in my province of British Columbia, Canada, is that the BC government, to encourage angel investors and risk taking, they will give investors a 30% refundable tax credit. That means if I, as an angel investor, invest $100,000 in your company, as long as you're in British Columbia, you will, I will get back 30% or $30,000 in cash from the government for making that investment. That's a very compelling incentive. And that has allowed, <laughs> I'm glad you think so, and that has allowed uh, myself and others to create these capital pools. Because if you invest in a pool like this, and this is a pool, you will get your 30% back. You can also, if you're living in Canada, use this in a retirement savings account and get another 43% tax break. So you're getting fantastic leverage for every dollar that you invest in a fund like this, you're increasing it by initial, an additional $3. So for every dollar, you've really got $4 invested in a company. So you can afford to take some risks, and you can afford a few failures, and you can still hopefully get that 27% return. So that's a little bit about what I do. In summary, I love angel investing. I like doing direct deals. My current mandate is to build angel funds and to encourage communities to build angel funds. If any of you here want to build a fund in your community, whether it's in Santiago or in, in Brazil or Buenos Aires, please come and talk to me because I'd be happy to share with you some of the things that I've learned about managing a fund, how you get investors into it, how you report to them, how you work on getting a return on capital for those investors. And for all of the entrepreneurs in the audience, good luck, and I wish you the best of success, and thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Oh, yeah, are there some questions? Sure, sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. 
Hey, thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. My question is about the business model of uh, angel funds. So, uh, how do you manage governance? So having lots of angels and how do they take decisions if, if they do? And do you charge an administration fee or you know, mm -hmm. how it works? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, one of the, um, you know, the typical venture capital model is you, you get institutions and high net worth individuals to put money into a pool, and then you have a fund manager, and the fund manager takes 2 to 3% of the value of the fund each year, which I think is obscene. It's way too much, um, plus 20% of any upside. Um, what, the way most angel funds work is there's a participation fee, but no management fee. So in the case of my funds, for example, I would take a 20% um, carry on any successful exits. That's my incentive for doing it. But I'm also co-investing with others, so I'm not investing other people's money. The difference between an angel and a VC is an angel invests his or her own capital, and a VC invests other people's money. So in my case, even though I take that 20% carry, my own capital is invested with other investors. But there's no management fee, and that's what motivates us. As far as the governance, it's really quite simple. You run it like a business. You get a board of directors, and the board of directors reports to the shareholders. The shareholders are the investors. And if you have a good governance structure, then I think um, you'll have a good business and a good outcome. It's, it's that simple. It's really not complicated. Sure, a couple more. Yes, sir. If we wanted to learn how to create a fund, what would you advise how you get started? Because it's a fairly complex world, and understanding really how to get it right from the beginning, if you don't have a track record, it's pretty tough. Yeah, when, when Rob Wiltbank uh, did his um, survey, um, he found there were three success factors to angel investing. Um, number one was doing a lot of due diligence. So you have to learn about due diligence. And organizations like the Kauffman Foundation, all the startup groups um, have information on due diligence. So due diligence as a fund is as important, if not more important, than due diligence as a sole individual angel investor. Number two was um, the post-investment follow-up providing support after the investment, not just making an investment and then waiting. Um, and one of the most valuable contributions is on the governance side, making sure that the company has an independent board of directors. And I would encourage that for any company, even from day one. It's easier than you think to get a board of directors, to hold the CEO and the team accountable. And the third success factor that uh, Wilt Bank identified, and again, this is where funds come in, do a lot of deals. You've got to do more than 20 deals for a fund to be successful because you never know which are going to be the winners. My favorite story in terms of picking winners, you know, it was about 25 years ago when I visited one entrepreneur. He called me. I had just sold my company, and he needed $30,000 to start his business. That was a little tiny company located above a 7-Eleven store in a strip mall in Waterloo, Ontario. That company became Research in Motion with the BlackBerry. And I negotiated a $30,000 investment for 15% of the company. But it was just a little startup. You know, I didn't know they were going to be famous and have a BlackBerry. So I said, you only need $30,000. Um, and someone this morning, I don't know if it, if it was uh, you, Victoria, someone else was asking about equity and, you know, giving your employees. No, I think it was, it was um, Torsten. Torsten, you mentioned it. And so what I did was I told Mike Lazaridis, the founder of BlackBerry, and this was long before he had his co-CEO in there. I said, listen, instead of taking my money and giving me a percentage and paying, giving that money to your engineers, why don't you just give them the shares? Cut me out. You don't need a middleman. And he said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And, you know, let me tell you a funny story. So the one guy who was going to get the shares, he went home, and he says to his father, hey, Dad, um, Mike here wants to give me uh, 
chairs instead of a paycheck. And the father said, son, why don't you get a real job? <laughs> and the funny thing is, as most children do, they don't listen to their parents, and he took the shares. Fast forward about 20 years later, I bump into his wife in an art gallery in Ontario. I said, oh, this is a nice coincidence. What are you doing? She said, we just donated $100 million to the <laughs> Arts Foundation. So there you go. There's a, a good example of how entrepreneurship can really pay off for you in the community. So I, I don't know if I, that's a long answer to a short question. But, um, but to get your fund going, there's a lot of resources available. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's becoming uh, a movement and uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of expertise out there. Many angel groups throughout, not just the US, but globally are setting up angel funds and angel pools. The interesting thing is they're all a little different. They all have slightly different models. Um, so it would really behoove you to do some homework on it and some research. And if you like, I did a little study myself of what's happening in, in other angel networks and I'd be happy to share that with you. Yeah, the, actually what I wanted to know, this is great, but what, what, what I really was asking is, there's so much material you can read about this that it's actually hard to know which one is good. And if you had like some, like if you could advise or tell us a couple of books maybe that you think are really yeah. good to get informed and to get started. Yeah. It, uh, and, I, and I'll do that with you. I'd be happy to do that with you. The, the caution here is that because it's a recent phenomenon, angel pools is a recent, <laughs> like only in the last five years or so. I mean, there were a few maybe 10 years ago, but it's really heating up now. There isn't the track record, right? You can't point to different groups and say that works and that doesn't work. It's still a bit too early. So it's a bit inconclusive. So the best you can do is to look at works for successful angel outcomes in general and try to apply that to an angel fund. But I'd be happy, I've got lots of resources I can, I'd be happy to share with you. Thank you very much. That's it, I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook. Thank you very much. Okay.